All right, we are in Holy Spirit part one, and this is lesson eight of part one, which means part one is coming to a conclusion. And like I say, next week we'll give you an opportunity to show us how much you've retained. Hallelujah. And I'll give a disclaimer, I don't make the test. So don't anybody come fussing at me. I'm innocent. All right, let's open your Bibles to Acts chapter one. And read a verse of scripture here to introduce this particular lesson. Acts chapter 1, verse number 8, Jesus is speaking to his followers before he ascends back to heaven, preparing them for what's about to take place. And he, uh, in the first few verses there, he is saying to them that, uh, you know, you've heard this promise of the Father. And he repeated the promise that John the Baptist uh, is recorded in all the Gospels about how he wasn't worthy to unloose Jesus' shoelaces. And uh, when he come, uh, John said, I indeed baptize you with water, but the one coming after me, meaning Jesus, is going to baptize you in the Holy Ghost and with fire. And now Jesus is saying, this promise that you've been hearing is just now a few days from happening. And he says, it's going to happen not many days hence. Then in verse number 8, he says, You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me both in Jerusalem and all of Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. Jesus made this statement. I happen to be one of those that believes Jesus knew what he was talking about. And so... Uh, for me to really take advantage of what Jesus is saying, I need to understand what he was saying. And so we want to define two words there that are key to understanding this verse of Scripture. And the first word is power. Now, it, you don't have to say it, power. power. <laughs> yeah. And... It doesn't have to be explained that the Greek word is dunamis or dynamis, which they say is the root word for dynamite, and they're trying to make some point. But if you really want to get full meaning of what Jesus is saying, you look at the true definition of the word power, and I'm talking about the biblical perspective. The first definition given for the word power is to be able to be able. The second definition given is to be capable. To be capable. The next definition is ability. So here in the first few words that defines power, it means to be able, to be capable, to have ability. Now it also goes on and, and it talks about it being a force. It talks about it being miraculous power. But if you read it now with that thought in mind, you see Jesus is saying to his disciples that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you in this, to them, a new way, 
when He comes upon you, you're going to receive ability. You're going to become able. You're going to be capable. And what are you going to have the ability and to be able and to be capable to do? He says, to be witnesses. Didn't say, and you shall go out and witness. It says, you shall be witnesses. Now, what is a witness? Let's define that. It's pretty simple when, when you look at the definition. One who remembers. One who has information or knowledge of anything. And you know, we could break that down, and, and most of us have, you know, at least been exposed in some form or fashion to a, a courtroom setting. And know, we know they call witnesses, but witnesses can only testify of that which they've witnessed. In other words, they can only tell what they know. And Jesus is saying, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you're going to have the ability to tell what you know. You're going to be able to give information. You're going to be able to bring light. You're going to be able to confirm things. And he is saying that once you receive this ability from the Holy Spirit... You're going to be able to go out and you're going to be able to, to demonstrate what you know. Now, I'm going to take the rest of the lesson, lesson and I'm going to go through here and I'm going to identify some of those abilities that we see in the early church and let you see how what they did testify of what they know about their relationship with the Lord. And once again, uh, you know, I went through the denominational rigmarole of what it meant to go witness. And, you know, we had the four spiritual laws and we had all these th things to plan and manipulate. You know, I, I, it, it's, uh, you know, sad as I look back on it. I'm sure some of those people that we went out and and spent time with, really had a genuine encounter with God. But remember one time I went out, I was a little nervous about going, wasn't comfortable going. So my pastor said, well, I'll just go with you and show, show you how it's done. And so as we're driving over this house, he's saying, now, now you watch how I'm going to get control of the conversation. <laughs> he said, I'll start talking about something that doesn't have anything to do with what we're doing, but I'll ease them right in to where we'll get them down to where they need to receive Jesus. I'm sorry, I'm having flashbacks. <laughs> so we went in, sat down, and met with them, and so he starts, you know, they're, they, they're talking, then he, you know, I kind of knew, now he's taking over, so I better watch this. And he said, boy, that is one nice painting up there. By the way, are either one of you born again? <laughs> uh, just eased right into that. <laughs> it's awesome. So anyhow, I want, I want to show you the Bible way of witnessing and testifying and demonstrating. So the first one I've got listed there is this power, this ability that liberates or sets free our spirit to communicate directly with God. I mean, you know, that's, that's a good ability to have, to be able to communicate spirit to spirit with God. And I've listed as the reference there, Acts chapter 2. This is after they've been obedient to the Lord. They've been waiting there for 10 days. You know, the invitation was given to 500. Only 120 accepted it. 380 had something more important to do than obey God. Isn't that amazing? When I was pastoring, I said, don't miss prayer meeting. You might miss something powerful. The 380 that missed prayer meeting really missed out on something, huh? The 120 that stayed, Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. 
I don't know why, and maybe it's because it's Friday, but that reminds me of one of those biblical jokes. Have you ever heard it? What kind of car did the disciples drive? An accord. <laughs> they were all in one accord. <laughs> oh, this could go on, and I better not go there. They're pretty bad, but uh, they're retaping this, so I'm trying to get them all on. They're retaping this, so I'm trying to get them all on. <laughs> and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as, as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared to them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So here's this uh, uh, communication. And now, let's hold your place there and let's go over to 1 Corinthians. And we're, we'll have all of this in more detail later on, but this is just to get us on the same page here. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, at verse number 2. Now, Acts 2, 4 says they begin to speak with other tongues. 1 Corinthians 14, 2 says, He that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not to men but to God. So here's, here's the point I'm making. Is that once you receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit, you receive the ability to communicate to God spirit to spirit. Because when you're speaking in tongues... You're speaking to God, and no man understands. You say, is that important? Absolutely. God is a spirit, and we need spirit-to-spirit -spirit communication. Before you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the ability to speak in other tongues, the only way you can communicate with God is through your carnal mind which has not been totally renewed. Therefore, we are limiting our communication with God because our minds control what we say and our minds have not uh, reached that state of perfection yet. God is a spirit, and we need the spirit-to-spirit -spirit communication. So being able to speak in tongues gives you that ability to communicate directly with God. He that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks to God, not to men. This ability has come upon you. And let's read a couple more verses here. Verse 14, chapter 14. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays. My understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I'll pray with the Spirit, and I'll pray with the understanding. I'll sing with the Spirit, and I'll sing with the understanding also. So he's telling us this ability to communicate Spirit to Spirit with God. This ability comes when we receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. You know, a lot of people uh, have, uh, you know, well, there's a great fear out there about speaking in tongues. Uh, everybody's so afraid that uh, they're going to get something that's not of God. Well, you know, the Bible says if we being evil know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will our Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? If you ask God for the Holy Spirit, He's not going to give you a demon. That should go without saying, and yet there's some people all hung up. Well, I'm afraid if I speak in tongues, it might be a demon speaking. <laughs> Not unless you ask the devil to give you something. If you ask God and he goes on to say, you're going to give him a, a rock for bread? In other words, he, he goes through great detail to show you that what you asked for from God is what God's going to give you. Then there are people then, if, if you can't, if they see clearly from Scripture that tongues is a legitimate gift from God, then they want to start saying, well, you know, that's one of the lesser gifts. You won't find that in Scripture either.
Matter of fact, I think it's one of the most important gifts, and that's the reason the devil has fought it so hard. Because it is the one that enables you to go perfectly communicating with God, spirit to spirit. There's not another way. It's also, well, I'm going to throw this one out to you. Just for your consideration. Over in, in Genesis, we don't have to turn over there, but about the 11th chapter, there's an event that has been commonly referred to as the Tower of Babel. And this is where a group got together and said, we're going to build a building, we're going to build it right on to heaven. Now, the interesting part about that, God says that if they uh, continue in unity, they'll probably be able to do it, showing you the power of unity. So he said, Let's, uh, we've, we've got to stop this. So they confused the languages. And so that's where all the languages that men speak now have uh, come into being. That happened in Genesis. But now, let me just for a second, and you'll hear this again when we get to Old Testament survey, but we'll, I want to talk about it right now because it fits right here too. If I can find it, you know, I don't know about you, but every once in a while the books in my Bible move around. <laughs> they weren't where they were the last time I was there. Y'all ever notice that? Thank God for the index. I know it's in here. I just got to find it. Maybe I ought to tell you so you can get there at the same time I do. I'm looking for Zephaniah. And I found it. <laughs> yeah, go to Malachi and go backwards. Zephaniah, chapter 3. You know, back before I was so sanctified, I used to, when I pastored, I used to do some naughty things to the congregation. I remember one Sunday morning, I, I stood up and just as serious as I could be. I said, this morning, let's open our Bibles to the book of Hezekiah, chapter 9. And I just sat there and waited and heard all these pages turning. <laughs> but I'm, I've uh, reformed. Don't do those kind of things anymore. Zephaniah, have you found it? Chapter 3, verse number 9, what's the first word? Well, there's four of you found it. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 9, For then will I turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve Him with one consent. All right, now we, we just talked about the Tower of Babel where the language was were confused. But God says the day is coming in the last days that I'm going to give them a pure language so that they can all be in unity and worship me with one consent. Now I want to suggest to you something, and like I say, it's just for your consideration. But I don't know of another thing that's, that's happening in the body of Christ that people in a room this size can all be in 100% unity except when we're all speaking in tongues. And the reason I say that, we got people in here from every kind of background imaginable. Baptist, Methodist, Church of Christ, Seminary of God, Lutheran, Presbyterian. You just go right down the, and, and heathens. You know, we, we've got the whole gamut. We've got them from, from Texas and probably nearly all the, the states here in the Union and some foreign countries. And so as varied as we are, do you know what the one thing that all of us will be in total unity when we're doing is when we're all speaking in tongues. I don't know of another thing happening in the body of Christ that creates that kind of unity. And isn't it amazing that you can do all the research and read all the, the uh, polls and all that stuff's being taken, and the fastest growing segment of the body of Christ are those who speak in tongues. Nearly every major denomination, their membership is going down 
while membership in those who believe in the, the believe the Bible <laughs> are, are all going up. And the common thread of all those people is that they all speak in tongues. Now, you can take all people that speak in tongues and you can get them into some very hot debates over doctrine. So I can be with a brother that I totally disagree with his doctrine, but if we both start praying in tongues, we're in total unity. And I believe this is what, I believe this is what uh, the prophet was prophesying, that there was going to come a pure language. And I mean, you know, it is pure because it totally bypasses this thing, and it comes out of a pure, recreated spirit. And so, no wonder it's fought so much because the devil knows if we ever get in unity, nothing can stop us. So just remember, you know, it, it's hard to gossip about somebody when you're speaking in tongues. <laughs> it's hard to lie speaking in tongues. It really is. It, it's, it's hard to you know, talk about somebody in tongues. It's hard to criticize the instructor in tongues. <laughs> I'm just saying when, you, when you're speaking in tongues, I mean, it is just communicating with God and it, we're all on one page, we're all in unity, and, and nothing is separating us from the Father. And Jesus said, you're going to receive this ability when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you will have this ability to communicate to me spirit to spirit. Isn't that awesome? Amen. Then Paul goes on and explains over in Corinthians, he said, and, and he that prays in an unknown tongue edifies himself, builds himself up. You're building your spirit man up when you're praying in tongues. You say, how's that work? I don't know how that works, but God said it worked. There's a lot of things I don't know how they work, but I enjoy them. I'm going to get on a jet next week. I don't know how that thing works, but I'm glad it works because instead of taking 16 hours, I'm be there in two, you know. I'm glad it doesn't stay up in the air depending on my ability to understand. We would be in a vast amount of trouble. So I don't understand how that works, that my spirit man is being edified and built up by praying in tongues. But God says that's how you build yourself up in, the, in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. And so Paul says, I pray in tongues more than y'all. That means that he kept himself fired up, built up, edified on a continual basis because he spoke in tongues a lot. I don't know how much that was, but he said he did it more than the rest of them. So he, he spoke in tongues a lot. And, you know, these people that are so opposed to people who are speaking in tongues, they need to tear out half of their New Testament because it's written by a tongue talker. <laughs> then when you get to talking to the Catholics, you know, and they're always wanting to talk about Mary, you'd say, well, you know, Mary spoke in tongues. Well, it's right there that she was in the upper room with a bunch when they were all baptized in the Holy Ghost. Oh, Mother Mary. <laughs> it's important. You know, I, a lot of times I illustrate this. One of the most sickening sounds in the world, and, and we're moving towards that season, but... To get up in the morning, you're running a little late to come to school, and you run out and you jump in your car. It snowed last night, and you jump in, put the key in the ignition, and it goes, wrong, click, click. <laughs> is that a sick sound or what? <laughs> a dead battery is a sick sound. And, you know, not only is it drain, you drain. I mean, you just, mm -hmm. <laughs> Anybody relate to a dead battery? Well... You need to keep your battery charged. Now that translates over into the spiritual realm. And those of you that don't pray in tongues much, your battery is probably going to go down. And when God speaks to you and asks you to do something, a lot of times all he gets is wrong, click, click. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. 
But if you pray in tongues, you keep your spirit hot like that battery, and when God says do something, boom, you're ready to, to go and do it. Serious. It's what the Bible teaches, so you say, well, I don't understand. Well, I don't understand it, but do it. Just pray in tongues. Keep you out of trouble. Number two. When you're baptized in the Holy Ghost and you receive this ability, guess what? You have the ability to have boldness in the face of persecution. You have the ability to, face, to have boldness in the face of persecution. And the scriptural account that I've listed to, to teach this one is, is there in Acts chapter 3. And it starts off with this statement. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. They're going to prayer meeting. As they get there, there's a man lame from his mother's womb. And they, he was carried there. And they lay daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Now, a lot of things we could say here, but isn't it, isn't it interesting that this man who couldn't walk would have to have his friends or someone to carry him wherever he went, and he wanted them to carry him to the door of the church every day. To what? Beg for alms. Now see, even the world knows that it should be at the church where you can get help. He didn't have them carry it to the marketplace. Because he figured nobody down there is going to care about me, but they're supposed to care about me at the church, so take me to the church where I can beg. Now, when he saw Peter and John about to go in the temple, he asked for alms. And Peter fastened his eyes upon him with John said, uh, Now don't look at us. Look at Jesus. See, y'all aren't reading your Bible, are you? <laughs> Those egotistical. Peter and John, who do they think they are? Acting like that. They just knew who they were in Christ. And they were all charged up and built up because they'd been praying in tongues before they got to prayer meeting. And so he looked at them and expecting them to give him something. Peter said, well, silver and gold have I none. And you know what he was really saying? Money is not going to solve your problem. These guys weren't broke, so that's not what he's saying. We don't have any money. He's just saying money is not going to answer your problem. And he says, but uh, such as I have give I you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. You realize they did that before they got to prayer meeting. They didn't say, sit right there, we'll go in and pray. We'll get built up, we'll get edified, we'll get, and, and we might even have the pastor come out. Now, I want you to see this. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of having fun with it, but I'm serious about it. They were going to church. They hadn't got there yet. They had not gone into the prayer meeting and, and uh, bound all the powers of darkness and pleaded with God to open the heavens and come down. They hadn't sung three fast songs, three slow songs. They hadn't even heard the message yet. They didn't go in and say, anybody in the congregation anointed to heal the sick? The reason I'm saying that is we've, we've used all of these as excuses for not ministering to people. Well, you know, I, I, I'm not, I, I can't pray for it, but I know somebody who can't. Let me just run in the church a minute. The pastor prays for sick people. One of the elders is in charge of the healing school. 
I want you to see that Peter and John were walking in such confidence of who they were in Christ and who Christ was in them. They were so confident of the power, the ability that the Holy Spirit had given them that they just said, look at us. And what we got, we're going to release to you. And every one of you in here, the Bible says, you have received an anointing. You have an unction from the Holy One. You've got the same spirit in you that raised Christ from the dead. And you can say with confidence, what I got is what you need. Christ from the dead. And you can say with confidence, what I got is what you need. And you can be that bold if you understand who you are. And then he leaped up, stood and walked and entered in the temple, walking and leaping and praising God and usher, calm that man down. We'll have none of that fanaticism in our service. After all, this is a holy place. <laughs> and all the people saw him walking and praising God and they knew that it was he which sat for arms at the beautiful gate of the temple and they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened and as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John all the people ran together to them in the porch that's called Solomon's great and wondered when Peter saw it what, what was happening, he stood up and preached Jesus to them. He took the opportunity to preach the message. And how many heard him preach that message, we don't know. But verse 4 of chapter 4 says, However, many of them which heard the word believed... And the number of them was about 5,000. So now you would think a lame man getting healed and 5,000 people getting saved, the whole city should have been rejoicing. But guess what? Verse 1, chapter 4. And as they spoke to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple... And the Sadducees came upon them, <laughs> being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead, and they laid hands on them, and I don't mean in Jesus' name, <laughs> and put them in the hold or in the prison until the next day, for it was now evening. Verse 5, it came to pass on the morrow that the rulers and elders and scribes, the high priest, and as many as were the kindred of the high priest were gathered together in Jerusalem. I'm telling you, was it something I said? Okay. <laughs> so I want you to see here, these are the religious leaders of the day. It wasn't the government. It was the people that were professing to serve God that got mad because a man got healed and 5,000 got saved. And you know what? Today, as we sit right here, if you went and got somebody healed and 5,000 saved, if you didn't do it their way, they'd probably get mad at you. How many of you were in denominational churches and you got baptized in the Holy Ghost, spoke in tongues, went and told your pastor, guess what, pastor? I'm speaking tongues. You want to hear? Did he get excited with you? None of you ever did that? None of you ever came out of denominational church? You never made any of those folks upset when you told them you were baptized in the Holy Ghost? I tell you, you don't even have to get baptized in the Holy Ghost. Make most of them mad. Just say, you listen to Andrew. <laughs> That will usually suffice. But these people got mad for, for them healing a cripple. They're arrested, not for stealing, not for killing, not for committing adultery, but for healing a cripple man. They're in jail. Now look what happens in, beginning with verse 7. 
And when they sat them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? And then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said to them, You rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man by what means he is made whole, be it known to you, to all of you, to you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set in nothing of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we might be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. So this is what happens when the Holy Spirit comes on you, he gives you the ability to have boldness in that time of persecution, and in so doing, you're witnessing of your relationship with Jesus Christ because they said, yeah, these guys are not that sharp, but one thing, we, they've been with Jesus. This is what Jesus was talking about. You shall receive this ability when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, and you will be witnesses. And was... What did they do? They healed a lame man, 5,000 got saved. And what could the religious people do but say, hey, we don't know all they're doing, but they must have been with Jesus or they couldn't be doing this. It's this ability that you receive when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Then they went on and, and uh, they saw the man that was healed. What are they going to do about that? It was a notable miracle had taken place. So they just called him in and said, uh, well, we're not going to do anything to you. Just don't go preach anymore in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John, verse 19, answered and said to them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken to you more than to God, then you make up your mind. But we cannot but speak the things which we've seen and what we've heard. And so when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing, how they might punish them because of the people for all men glorified God for what had been done. But the man was above 40 years old on whom the miracle healing was showed. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all the chief priests and elders said to them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, your God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David has said, why did the heathen rage the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth, right on down. But now, jump down for the sake of time to verse 29. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, <laughs> and grant to your servants that with all boldness we may speak the word. You know, those guys seem pretty bold beforehand. Now they're praying for boldness. And he said, and here's how we want you to demonstrate that boldness. By stretching forth your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of your holy child, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. So here, once again, this, this ability that you receive when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you have the ability to speak boldly in the face of persecution. And demonstrate what God has said. The third thing, the ability you receive, the whole thing is recorded in Acts chapter 7. And that's the account of, of Stephen, who had, was first of all a table waiter, and then he became a preacher of the gospel. And Stephen, with boldness, began to speak. Then jumping in at verse 54 of the account, when he got through preaching, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped up their ears, and ran upon him, cast him out of the city and stoned him. And as they did, he was saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. 
He kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep or he died in Christ. You know what? What this is saying is once we receive the ability of the Holy Spirit, we have no more fear of death. Hebrews 2 talks about how the one who once had the power of death has had that taken away from him. We need to see this. Folks, we need to, we, we need to realize that when we step from this life, we step right into the very presence of God. You don't miss a beat. It's a home going. This world is not our home. Now, I'm not anxious to go because I feel like I still got some things to do that God has assigned me to do. So I'm not, I'm not, uh, not professing I'm looking forward to that. I'm just telling you I don't have any fear of it. And there's too many Christians, and, and when, you, when you visit with them, and they still have a fear of dying. And the Holy Spirit will give you that ability that you can face death without that fear, and in so doing, you're given a testimony. Man, how many hundreds of stories have we been told about people who had been born again and, and serving God that when they died, they just went out so peaceful? And yet people who had not accepted the Lord and had lived heathen lives when they died went out with all kinds of anguish and agony and, and screaming and, and just, there's a difference. And when people see when we lose a loved one, you know what? Do we, do we grieve? Yes, but not as the world. You know, just about all of my family, I, I was one of five children I've got one brother left. My mom and dad are gone, and, and uh, my other brothers and sisters are gone. I had a few nephews to go, some in-laws that are gone. So, you know, basically, I've got one brother left. But as far as I know, each one of them had a relationship with Jesus, and so I'm, I hated to see them go, but you know what? I knew where they were going. So I didn't have this long grieving process. Matter of fact, I was the baby, so I was kind of spoiled, and I, my mother really spoiled me, almost to the point that my brothers and sisters resented me. But I don't know why they would. I mean, she made the right choice. I was the, <laughs> the special one. But we were very close, and I used to remember uh, thinking, now, how am I going to handle this when my mom dies? And sure enough, she passed away, and, and I was just really kind of dreading. So anyhow, we got down to the funeral home for the family viewing, and, and I didn't know how I was going to respond. I was hoping I could handle it, but I didn't know because I never lost a parent. So I walked up to the, to the casket and, and, and looked down there, and all of a sudden I realized, you know, that's just where the person I loved lived while she was here. The person I had a relationship with and the one I loved is not there anymore. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was a real healing for me to know that this was just her earth suit and that the real her was up in heaven enjoying her mansion. And that one day I'd be joined back together with her. You know what? If you allow the Holy Spirit, he'll make those things real to you. Heaven's a real place. And, and you know, it, it'll be exciting when we get there. But we've got assignments to complete before we go. But we shouldn't fear death. And this is the thing that, that influenced so many people back when, when Christians were really being persecuted. And I know in some parts of the world now, they're still being persecuted. But the thing that so many were turned to the Lord when they saw those Christians die, praising God as they were being burned at the stake. This is the ability, God says, I'll give you. I, you know, I, I don't know. I think it's three years ago now. I'm pretty sure it's three years. Maybe, I, I think it's three, maybe four but I had a, 
I had a massive heart attack. Matter of fact, I had a series of three. Uh, the third time it hit, I just uh, felt like I'd better go to the hospital. First two times I tried to, to believe it away. Third time I thought it was pretty serious, so I went ahead and went to the hospital. And sure enough, I was in the midst of a heart attack. And so they did all the things that they're supposed to do. And, you know, I, ne I never have liked hospitals. Even when I pastored, I didn't like to visit hospitals. I didn't like the way they smelled. I didn't like anything about them. But I can remember even going to visit a, a person in the church when they were about to have surgery. And, you know, they'd let the pastor stay with them right up to the last minute. And then they'd say, well, now we're going to take them down to the operating room. And I can remember as they're rolling that thing through those swinging doors to take them back to surgery. Even as a pastor, I used to get a little nervous about what was going on. Well, that day came when they, they told me they was going to have to do uh, uh, a quadruple bypass. I remember laying there and my wife and kids were there and they said, well, uh, it's time to take him. And as they're rolling me out, I'm thinking, now, shouldn't you be a little nervous about this? I mean, my mind was having a, shouldn't you be a little more concerned than this? And you know what? I experienced that peace that passeth all understanding. And they, they rolled me down that hall and got me in there and rolled me on that bed and all those lights over. Boy, it was cold in there. And uh, they had their mask on. And they were all gathering around. <laughs> I had this image of these vultures around the carcass, you know, just, I mean, they were probably nice people. I couldn't tell who they were. They had their mask on. But the guy, the surgeon came up and he says, well, we're about to put you under. Have you got any, uh, anything you'd like to ask before we put you under? I said, I said, one question. He said, what's that? And I said, you have done this before, haven't you? <laughs> now, the, I say that to say I, I experienced this no fear of death, I experienced the peace that passeth all understanding. I can testify and tell you it's true. It's not theory. It's the real thing. And God gives you that ability. Uh, and, and, you know, it was amazing. And God just blessed through the whole thing. And here I am still going. But we need to know we don't have to fear death and the Holy Ghost will give you that ability to face death without fear. Amen? And that testifies to other people. All right? And the last thing, the last few minutes, it gives you the power to face the devil and demon forces. Anytime you start to do something for God, I guarantee you, you're going to have some opposition from the devil and his crew. And here in Acts 13, you can, you can read how Paul and them were being opposed by someone that was being used by the devil and shows how he handled them. And this is just a testimony. We don't have time to read the whole deal, but you can, you can read that and understand that as you draw upon the power of the Holy Spirit, anytime the devil or demon forces come against you, you have the ability to withstand them. And you can take control of the situation and just know that comes through the ability of the Holy Spirit. And when you do so, you're given witness that you're connected to a higher power. Amen.